Welcome to the Geological Society of the Oregon Country, Geology Talks monthly Zoom meetup. We are the oldest collaboration of amateurs and professional geologists in the Pacific Northwest. We've been pulling over the car, stopping at outcrops and picking up rocks for over 86 years now. And uh, for the past 50 years, we have had a strong relationship with the Portland State Geology Department. We have been having our lectures in person there and in January, we will resume our in-person lectures. But for now, everything has been online. One of the things that we have uh, been working on a lot with the Geological Society is our relationship with the wonderful graduate students at Portland State uh, through the Beverly Vote PSU Graduate Student Fund. And we have two of those students here today, one Andrew Dunning to give the geology news and the other Rachel Sweeten to talk about her fascinating work uh, mapping in the strawberry volcanics and also some exploration work that she's going to tell us about. Uh, before we do that, we're going to have a few announcements about club activities. Clark was just telling us about the in-person meetup. And Clark, if you could just repeat the basic information for those people. We who... are every, every month on the third Saturday, we meet in person at the Weinstock uh, Deli and, and uh, uh, I call it wine, uh, it's a wine shop. And uh, we meet there and we have, uh, we bring in our, our favorite rocks and we, we have a, a good time explaining what they are and identifying them and having some good, uh, camaraderie and a, and a tasty sandwich. So that's our that's our meetups on, on the third Saturday of the month. Third Saturday of the month at the Woodstock Wine and Deli. That's 41st in Woodstock. And those of you who are uh, calling in today from uh, Pennsylvania or Colorado or Minnesota are as welcome to come as any of those of you locally here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I think we will also, I don't see our, our field trip. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't see... Sheila Alfson, who uh, is our programming coordinator and can tell us about uh, upcoming lectures, but we learned in the, the pre-show there that she'll be giving a lecture on her Assembling Oregon lecture for the Minnesota group, and I forget who it was. Was it Stephen? You were telling us about that? So if people want to see a geology lecture, and they want to see a good one because we've heard Sheila give this lecture before, how would they get that? How would they attend that, Stephen? All right, go to www.gsmn.org and they'll have links set up on that. Minnesota Geo Society, MNG, MN, just a second, hang on. MNGSM, MNGSM. Let me, let me uh, jump in here. GSM. Yes, please. MN.org. Right. And if you go there now, you'll see the upcoming talk, which is on uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota. And you're obviously welcome to that too. Um, and you can go to, uh, but if you, can, if you get there after uh, November, starting November 30th, uh, Sheila's talk will be on the front page because that'll be the next one. Wonderful. And I see that the website has been put in the chat. We have lectures here too at Portland State at Kramer Hall, which will be resuming in January on the second Friday of every month, our lectures. And the next one will be from Allison Perch, who's a geoengineer who's going to be talking about the critical energy infrastructure, which if you attended last month's meetup, you heard me talk about a little bit. These are these oil tanks on the Willamette River that are threatened in the event of a Cascadia earthquake, which we expect in a 30% chance over the next 50 years, the likelihood that we'll have a magnitude eight or nine earthquake. And those tanks provide 95% of the fuel to Oregon and are threatened by an earthquake with um, causing potential environmental catastrophe, as well as resources which we will need in the event of an earthquake to recover. So that is a interesting geology, engineering, and political issue that Allison will be talking about in January. And our plan is at this point that that will be in person at Kramer Hall 53, but our plan is also that that will be our first hybrid event. So it will be on Zoom is our plan again, hopefully. Let's cross our fingers that all of that will happen. Do we have any other Club announcements before we go on to Rachel's presentation. I think we might have a few field trips that we can talk about at this point. Clark, do you want to say anything uh, about upcoming field trips? GSOC is planning four, four field trips at this point right now, one of which will be to Crater Lake. Uh, the others will, uh, will be local 
to Portland. Uh, well, I think Paul, you're going to give uh, a, a, a bicycle tour. We, we then, Ian Maiden and, and Lala Guerrero are both going to be leading the East Side Bicycle Tour from the Steel Bridge on down to Milwaukee, right. from some of our youngest uh, sediments, youngest uh, deposits to some of the oldest here, although in Portland. Sign, me up. Sign you up? Okay. Yeah. And Peregrine will be there as well. And Green what Johnson else do we... Creek is, is another field trip. Uh, explore the basin. Uh, Johnson Creek is a, is a basin on the uh, east side of the, uh, of the Willamette River. Uh, essentially pretty much in the center of Portland or the suburbs of Portland. And I'm uh, along with Paul and, uh, and uh, 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 oh, come on, brain, it's not working this Matt? morning. Uh, Matt, yes, yeah. there we go. Renango, yes, are, Professor are Renango. A trip to the, uh, at least to the lower Clackamas River Basin. And if the roads open again, and I mean by, by that, I mean that the forest fire that went through the Clackamas River Basin uh, uh, they still have not been able to clear all the road hazards from that fire. If that is open, we'll do the upper basin to try to do most of that too. So those are basically our four, four trips for this year, for two, 2022. Will the Johnson Creek one also be a bicycle one? No, that it? will be a van trip, I believe. So um, uh, Rachel, tell us a little bit about yourself, about the work you're doing, and uh, I think you have a presentation, so you can kind of lead into that as, as you will. And okay, um, my name is Rachel Sweeten. I'm a uh, master's student over at Portland State University. I'm in my second year, and I'll be defending my thesis likely in the spring, um, and uh, I, I'm also going to be working as an exploration geologist for Lithium America, or Lithium Nevada, uh, starting in January. Okay. Um, for the past year and a half now, uh, uh, up until actually uh, at the end of uh, middle of October, uh, I've been doing some mapping out in the uh, John Day area, specifically uh, the western half of two quadrangles uh, that are related to the Strawberry Volcanics. All right, so as I was mentioning uh, just now in the self-introduction. Uh, 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 working in the Northeast Harney Basin, uh, which is near the cities of John Day and uh, Burns, which is a little covered up by some of the other graphics here. Um, and this was part of an ongoing uh, EDMAP grant uh, to Dr. Martin Streck to map out the Northern Harney Basin. Uh, the area was originally mapped uh, by uh, two people named Brown and Thayer uh, in 1966, but it was a uh, a significantly lower resolution, and they mapped the whole area either as picture gorge basalts or undifferentiated strawberry volcanics without really differentiating what the units are or anything like that. So it allowed the area to kind of escape uh, scientific notice for, uh, for a while. Um, however, recent years, uh, in large part due to uh, Dr. Streck's uh, mapping efforts out there, uh, uh, has demonstrated that there's a, a large and very understudied bimodal uh, which means that it's erupted both basalt and uh, rhyolitic lavas, or an even easier way to understand it is effusive and explosive eruptions and uh, some fairly large explosive eruptions as well. Um, and it also occurred at around the same time as the uh, Columbia River, it overlapped in time with the Columbia River basalts as well as the inception of the high lava plains. And it's kind of situated right there in the nexus point of uh, all, all three of these particular uh, volcanic systems. And uh, I, it makes it a very complicated tectonic and volcanic area to map. Um, now, as I was mentioning, uh, these eruptions uh, occurred throughout the Harney Basin uh, and as well as the mapping area between about 16 to 12 million years ago. Um, and it overlaps in time with the uh, Columbia River basalt, specifically the Picture Gorge, Steens, and Imnaha eruptions. And as I had mentioned a few moments ago, it's kind of at the nexus point of where all three of those systems kind of overlap to some extent. Um, and the very few basalts that are found in the area uh, uh, tend to be uh, uh, tend to be uh, uh, chemically very very similar to the Steens basalt, uh, which is important because these basalts are what helps warm up the crust to create these rhyolitic or bimodal, prov uh, bimodal provinces. Uh, 
And uh, like I was saying, volcanism in the region is caused by a complex blend of regional spreading. Uh, this was in an area that was getting pulled apart because of the uh, movement of the subduction zone from uh, near the Oregon Idaho uh, Oregon Idaho border outboard to uh, near the, its current position today. And as it's moving and uh, doing the subduction, it pulls apart uh, a portion of the continental crust because of the flexure. Um, as well as partial melting of the icy and old ferry terrains, uh, which are part of Sheila Allison's talk uh, of these exotic terrains that are scraped up to the edge of the North American continent um, and mixing with CRB magmas. So the CRB magmas both provided heat to melt some of, some of this crustal material to create these eruptions, but it also mixed with, with this crustal material. So it's kind of a hybrid of uh, uh, plume, uh, plume style magmas as well as uh, just melted continental crust. And as I had mentioned, I had mapped, two, I had mapped out uh, two quadrangles. One of those is the quadra quadrangle of Logan Valley West. And the mapping took place uh, uh, both during the 2020 field season as well as the 2021 field season. Uh, uh, the 2021 field season was mostly to wrap up a few small areas that I didn't have a chance to get to the previous summer. Um, it was assisted by the uh, Portland State University field camp uh, for two of those weeks. And uh, our mapping efforts uncovered two new rhyolite units within this area, so two new rhyolite flows and one new dacite flow, which is just a compositional a compositional term, meaning that it's got more uh, uh, more uh, dark colored minerals located in, in it, as opposed to a rhyolite, which is made up mostly of very light colored minerals that are very high in silica. So this has got a little, dacite's got a little less silica and a few more of those dark minerals uh, within it. Um, and the mapping efforts also helped expose uh, 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 the size of a local lignimbrite that goes with the uh, strawberry volcanics called the Tuff of Milk Spring. And uh, because of these mapping efforts, both for this quadrangle and the quadrangle to the south of it, uh, as well as mapping that's been done in previous years by uh, uh, Martin Strex grad students, um, we've been able to estimate that the eruption that formed the Signumbrite was about five times the size of Mount St. Helens and the caldera and would have created a caldera that would have been situated a little bit to the north of the quadrang uh, of this quadrangle that I'm showing here. <laughs> And the other quadrangle that I mapped was to the south of the one that I just showed you, and it's called Magpie Table. Um, and as well with this one, the mapping took, course, uh, uh, took place over the course of the 2020 and 2021 field season. Um, and we uncovered in this area two new rhyolites as well, as well as another uh, new day site, uh, as well as significant deposits of the Tuff of Milk Spring. That's the orange that we see on the map, both on this one and the previous one. I, they kept the colors consistent through both. Um, this area also contains a large amount of uh, uh, regional ignimbrite uh, deposits, specifically from high lava plains eruptions from calderas near, uh, near burns um, that are situated more central within the Harney Basin, uh, Harney Basin region. And uh, the, uh, uh, these were these particular eruptions were several hundred times the size of Mount St. Helens. And it, kind of, it, it, there obviously is a lot more complexity to how I to how I explained it. I kind of was trying to keep it a little uh, simpler and easier to understand. But the big picture the, of this area is uh, uh, we've got a much more extensive and diverse region of volcanism that's been really understudied and plays a huge part in uh, three or in two much larger volcanic provinces, the high lava plains, as well as the Columbia River basalts, with it being at the nexus point of all of them. Um, 
And it also uh, we also see evidence of large caldera forming eruptions occurring at that time as well. And these are important uh, uh, just both academically and helping us better understand the nature of how hot spots interact with continental crust. Um, as well as uh, these calderas can occasionally it, uh, expose or contain uh, precious mineral resources as well. Um, also, and it's not listed on here, uh, one of the uh, big reasons that uh, uh, Martin got the grant is because that area is becoming slowly more populated and utilized uh, significantly by ranchers and, and and other people that are out there doing farming, etc. And so understanding the bedrock geology of the area is really important to understanding the hydrology of the area and how the water is going to move when it rains up at a higher location. How is that water going to percolate down into, into the basins where everybody's living, ranching, and meeting those water resources? and understanding where all these units are located at because they've got different properties uh, uh, as far as water moving through them, uh, different porosities, uh, different reactions that occur with that water, uh, different things that can leach into the water supply. And so having a better understanding of you know, where these units are located at and what they chemically contain is, is pretty important. And I think you're not one to sing your own praises, but I understand that you won an award for uh, uh, some of this work. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, my advisor asked me to enter the uh, uh, Geologic Society of America student mapping competition and of approximately 30 or 35 contestants, I won second place. Well, congratulations. And I was... It actually also leads into the next thing that uh, Paul had mentioned. Uh, the quality of that map is what actually got me the job at Lithium Americas uh, as an exploration geologist intern. Uh, and I'll be doing exploration geology for lithium deposits uh, here for the next couple of months. And I want to ask you a little bit more about that. That's fascinating. And I want to ask you a little bit more about what will be involved in the, the exploration. But I'm, I'm also curious. You know, you see these maps, they're beautiful and beautiful colors in the maps. And I just wonder how much work actually goes. I've always kind of wondered like what the resolution is, like how much actual walking around and, and sampling, uh, you know, and how, how that happens, how, how, you, how you... So how you... each one of these quadrangles, uh, I, uh, for, uh, per quadrangle, I brought back somewhere between 50 to 70 samples from each quadrangle and each quadrangle contained approximately I'd like to say about seven to 750 stops. Um, and I'd say the work was split fairly evenly between a combination of very creative four-wheeling. Um, I'm a Jeep owner and uh, I believe in working smarter rather than harder when the opportunities present itself and uh, a Jeep is capable of getting into a significant amount of locations that would have required a lot of hiking to get into. Um, however, there's also an a, uh, overland hiking component where I'm hiking between 12 and 14 miles for the day over uh, mostly completely off trail with a backpack that has starts out with about 30 pounds of water and gear in it. And then by the time I get back to the vehicle, it has about uh, 10 pounds of gear and about 25 pounds of rocks in it. Um, so there's definitely a component of labor in, in, involved with it. Um, however, that only takes up a, 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 a of the process. It actually only takes up a short amount of time. Um, the rest of it is a lot of work. Um, I particularly use ArcGIS um, uh, as opposed to uh, some individuals who like to use things like Adobe Photoshop and whatnot. I prefer ArcGIS. It's specifically made to make maps and it happens to be pretty good at it. Um, and it also allows me to do a few programming things that allow me to uh, present some of the data in more interesting ways than I'd be capable of in presenting in like Photoshop and whatnot. And that's where the real time consuming part comes in is I try to get things as exact as possible. Um, so it requires a lot of it because it, it, as you're going out doing this mapping, you're only gathering data on a single point and you're having to apply those points to, to a region. And that's where the being able to read LIDAR and kind of 
being able to pick out the larger, more regional geology that helps delineate some of the smaller geologic units, um, that's where a lot of the work comes in and a lot of, no, that, that doesn't look like that's right because that's not the shape a lava flow would make, for example, um, and having to adjust things from there. And so there's a lot, of, a, a lot of editing that's involved. And at the resolution that I was at, I was at the seven and a half minute quadrangle resolution. And so typically, it, because I was only mapping half of it, I mapped it at a, a, a better resolution than you would normally expect for a one to 24,000 map. And so mine contains a fairly large amount of detail to it, um, both for surficial deposits and for the exposed bedrock stuff. And I uh, all told the two maps plus the map report that goes with it, which is about 50 pages worth of writing. Uh, uh, it took me about a year and a half to complete. And admittedly, uh, some of this was delayed uh, because of COVID and restrictions. I'm a single parent of two. So uh, there became things like, you know, childcare is issues to worry about, et cetera. Um, so that delayed the process. Otherwise, it, the time probably would have been halved. Your kids aren't old enough yet to assist you in the field, I would imagine. Um, actually, I disagree. They? My 12 year old oh. went with me all of oh. the uh, 2020 field season well, and wonderful. was a big help as far as carrying samples and stuff back. Oh, fantastic. And she shocked uh, uh, my advisor because he had never met a 12 year old that could keep up with the intensity of hiking that we perform during some of these mapping, uh, uh, mapping situations. That's great. Well, so I tell us about a five-year-old just hiked the Appalachian Trail. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> tell us about lithium exploration, because we all know lithium is critical to everything that we do now with our computers and our everything that we do with batteries. Mm -hmm. What's involved in lithium exploration? What are you doing there? Well, I happen to make a couple of slides for that, just in case I got asked this. Um, <laughs> foreshadowing, I knew I was going to. Um, so lithium, as Paul mentioned, is used in a very wide variety of electronics, especially batteries, which is what everybody's familiar with. And as green technology is becoming uh, more and more present and uh, fossil fuels are getting more and more phased out, we're going to see this being a much more critical resource over time. And while lithium itself is fairly common in the Earth's crust, uh, it's what's considered an incompatible element, meaning that it doesn't like to be inside silicate minerals, which is what you know our crust is made of. So it's uh, it, it ends up being what's considered a trace element because it only shows up in small concentrations, but that concentration is generally present throughout the entire crust. So because it's an incompatible element, it's got to go through certain processes to become concentrated enough to mine. And it occurs, one in speaking in generalities, it occurs through one of three processes. It either occurs in granite pegmatites, um, because these pegmatites, which are uh, 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 intrusive bodies that have got crystals greater than uh, greater than a centimeter, and crystal size can be used as a proxy for uh, uh, the stage of cooling uh, that this intrusive body's at. And these things are generally the very last thing to crystallize out when you've got a uh, when you've got an intrusion. And um, the more the greater the silica is, uh, the greater the ratio of incompatible elements because this, because these things are incompatible, as soon as they start to melt, uh, uh, it, they, they rush towards being in the liquid that's left. And as it's cooling, they try to stay within that liquid until, the, until that liquid finally stops being there and it has to crystallize. And those three minerals are called spodumene, uh, lipidolite, and uh, petalite. And we've, I've got pictures of them up here. We've, uh, this one, the white crystals that you see here, uh, that's sp uh, spodumene. Uh, this is uh, uh, petalite, and the brilliant purple stuff here is lipidolite. And I included this picture down here at the, pot uh, at the bottom, uh, which also can, it contains lipidolite, but this is uh, a good picture of a, uh, of a pegmatite. If you notice, these crystals in here are huge and they take up the vast majority of the rock. And that's really all pegmatite means is that it's got giant crystals uh, inside of it. Um, now, these things can also occur in low temperature hydrothermal brines. Uh, 
uh, meaning really, really hyper saline, uh, 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 low temperature uh, hydrothermal systems. And because lithium is very dissolvable in water, um, as it, it gets leached out of the surrounding rock and then gets concentrated in, in these hydrothermal systems. And we see this a lot in South American deposits uh, where you get uh, leaching occurring off of all these explosive vulca uh, volcanic deposits. Uh, in the Andean Plateau, and as the water's coming down, it's hitting the fault. It's hitting the fault at the base of the mountains and getting heated and then concentrating into brines and gets deposited in the really arid areas as these really, uh, uh, really concentrated brines and they can pull lithium out of that. And another good one that kind of combines a little bit of both of the both of the uh, previously mentioned processes is uh, through weathering and chemical leaching of very high silica rhyolites in, or rhyolitic deposits, whether it be ash, rhyolite, or intrusive bodies uh, uh, in, a, in a closed hydrologic system in the caldera. So when rain and whatnot is going through the caldera, instead of the water flowing out of the caldera, it all for, it flows towards the center. And it, in areas where it's had a lot of moisture, it'll form a caldera, a lake within the caldera. But as we know, much of the American West, except for the Pacific Northwest, is kind of arid, and most of these lakes have long since dried up. And what ends up happening is uh, uh, between that little bit of heat from from the residual volcanism, plus uh, these these pegmatites that form along the edges of the caldera. Uh, and the fact that the hydrologic system all leads to everything getting deposited in the center, it causes these, uh, it, it causes the lithium to get sequestered within clays that then get left, uh, then get left on the caldera floor as the lake has evaporated and moved on. Uh, you end up getting these lithium deposits. And uh, uh, here in the American West, we actually have a huge amount of calderas that actually fit, uh, fit the criteria bill for where these are primed to form. Uh, all through Oregon, Idaho, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, portions of Colorado, um, basically anywhere where you've got a giant super volcano caldera that's punching through, uh, that's punching through older continental crust or uh, older uh, a transitional crust has the potential to uh, uh, have these deposits. And uh, 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 one of the big ones, in fact, one of the largest in the world uh, has been located in McDermott Caldera, which is actually part of our own Snake River Plain, uh, Columbia River Basalt uh, uh, volcanism. Uh, so I, it's a fun, it's a fun tie into some of the other work that I've done between the strawberry volcanics, uh, some of the explosive eruptions in Southeast Oregon and what I'm working on for my master's thesis, which is relating to how the magma uh, was moving and was stored through the picture gorge steams in Northern Nevada rift eruptions. I think for people who aren't uh, from the Pacific Northwest, you might explain a little bit about the Snake River Plain and the whole connection that we have both to Cascading volcanism, but also this, this plume. Uh, I don't know that that would be familiar to our friends in the middle of the country. Can you explain that a little bit, the, what, 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 what you're dealing with with the plume vulcan volcanism? Certainly. Um, for, so uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, kind of contains examples of all the various different ways volcanism can occur. And the famous ones, the big, giant, gorgeous peaks that we see along the Cascades, uh, those occur through a process called subduction, where the oceanic plate is diving underneath the North American plate. And as it's going down, it's boiling off, uh, boiling off water and gases and all of that stuff in the oceanic plate that's going down. And this lowers the melting temperature mature the rocks above it, forming, uh, forming volcanoes. Um, now, that's the way 80, 85% of the volcanoes on Earth uh, uh, form are through subduction-related processes. Um, However, there's a special kind of volcanism that occurs through something called a, a hot spot, uh, which is uh, where a plume of superheated material from the lower uh, the lower mantle or the core mantle boundary uh, rises up through the mantle and punches through the Earth's crust. And as they punch through the crust, uh, the first thing they do is leave this giant outpouring of basalt uh, called Large Igneous Province. 
And that's what we have up here in, um, uh, in the Pacific Northwest it, with the Columbia River Basalt Group, uh, is, uh, which is a uh, uh, outpouring of a, a couple hundred a thousand cubic yard or cubic meters of uh, basalt reaching from northern Nevada, uh, uh, far eastern Washington, all the way out to the Pacific Coast. Uh, so to put it in perspective, it covers half of two states uh, I, and with portions of it going into another two states. Uh, to give you um, a, a difference in size, whereas one of these Cascade volcanoes is kind of a single point, it, you know, it's like Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens. Um, now, because these things are so huge and so much hotter than, than uh, the mantle around it, it also causes the continental crust to heat up and start melting a little bit. Um, uh, and that ends up forming these explosive volcanic eruptions. And we see that with the very hyped Yellowstone volcano and the calderas that have formed uh, uh, from the Yellowstone volcano go going all the way through, uh, uh, through Idaho and it being able to be traced back to the approximately near the uh, uh, Oregon Nevada border uh, down near McDermott and, and Steen's area. Um, and one other special type of volcanism that the, uh, that the American West has gone through, which was another uh, uh, episode of extremely, I would say literally some of the largest explosive eruptions the earth has ever seen. And that's when we had a subducting oceanic plate that was, instead of diving down flat like, or diving down steeply like this, it was diving flat. Well, it hit a point where it got wedged and snapped, and as it broke away and fell off, it sucks in all this hot mantle material all through the western U.S. that heats up the underside of the continent and starts causing little pockets of melt to show up because it's heating the underside of the continent so much. Um, this is called the mid-tertiary ignimbrite sweep. And when it heats up these little pockets, what ends up happening is, is it causes a little bit of extension and it causes these little pockets to explode. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, the largest explosive eruptions that we currently know of on the planet Earth uh, uh, occurred because of this particular process. And uh, we see that uh, in areas of the Great Basin, as well as uh, Colorado and, uh, and New Mexico as well. And many of those calderas are uh, definitely have the potential for lithium deposits as well. Well, fascinating. Thank you, Rachel. I think we might have some questions. I'm going to move to Andrew's geology news, and then at the top of the hour, I'll turn off the recording. And if you, if anyone has any more questions, if you can hang around uh, a little bit, uh, that would be great. And we want to hear more about your your work and your research as it pro pro progresses. So thank you for your uh, that fascinating. Connecting the mapping work with the with the exploration work, I think is it's valuable for us to learn just the extent to which that work is connected, not just as you pointed out to farming and hydrology, but also to something as critical as batteries. So thank you for your for your presentation, Rachel. No I'm gonna hand it, it hand it over to Andrew and uh, uh, have him share his screen and give us the geology news. Right on. All right. Afternoon, everyone. Get this going. Oh, this is supposed to be on. I'm trying out a second monitor thing here. Oh yes, that's always interesting. Well, we see your we see your screen. Just we're seeing it in presenter mode. Is that still presenter mode? We're still seeing presenter mode. The the paired screens right. thing. There we go. That's there fun. we go. That's it. <laughs> All right. This is the geology news for November 2021. I am Andrew Dunning, graduate student at Portland State University, uh, alongside Rachel. And I've been doing this segment now for uh, about a year and a half. And I've consistently enjoyed it and come back to do it as often as I can. I like to start out with earthquakes because I am an earthquake geologist. Over the last month, the largest event was a magnitude 6.6 .6 in the ocean south of, come on closer, south of Japan, right over here. There was also a 6.3 in Iran, followed one minute later by a magnitude 6.0. That was a pretty serious uh, series of events there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
There's also a 6.2 in Nicaragua. Luckily, Nicaragua is no stranger to large earthquakes, so um, I have not been able to find any reports of serious damage out in Nicaragua from that. The Iran series of earthquakes has caused significant damage to the area around the epicenters of these two earthquakes, and there was very intense ground shaking and at least one death. Here is a uh, image of some earthquake damage to a mosque out there in Iran. So that's a serious event, and hopefully they will be able to recover from that soon. In the United States, this is all earthquake uh, in the last 30 days above magnitude 2.5. So there's a pretty good spread over here as always in the western US. Uh, some clusters here in the Midwest related largely to oil and gas exploration and a magnitude 4.0 in Missouri right over here. Oh, uh, no, it was right here, it's this one. And this occurred in the New Madrid seismic zone, um, which is notable for creating the largest single earthquake event in United States history, uh, recorded history that is. However, um, you know, these kinds of this is basically background activity for the New Madrid seismic zone, so there's no reason to suspect that this is any kind of reawakening of that uh, very significant earthquake seismogenic zone. And in terms of the largest events in the US, there was a magnitude 4.4 off of Cape Mendocino in California. This is basically the most seismically active area on the continent, right in this area here. And just south of the border in the Gulf of California, there is a magnitude 4.9 in a whole slew of aftershocks in this area. So a little bit of a seismic swarm boiling up down there in the Sea of Cortez. And in Oregon, we had one earthquake in this size threshold of above magnitude two, just south of Cape Lookout last night, magnitude 2.5. As always, it's been another quiet month up here in Oregon. In terms of global volcanic activity, uh, there are still eruptions continuing at La Palma in the Canary Islands and Kilauea, and uh, there are 35 ongoing or new eruptions across the globe in this time period. There is a new activity at Seismo Poshnoi in Alaska, which is out in the Aleutian Islands. It's located right here, but since the Mercator projection wraps around in this image, uh, it shows up over here. Uh, there was a small lava flow issuing from the summit and a couple of ash clouds that disrupted some airline traffic. Nothing too serious going on in the world of volcanoes. Now I'm going to jump into some new research that's been published in the last month. I'm going to start off with a very interesting piece about the genesis of continental crust. So there's long been sort of a debate about how long continents have been present above the surface of the ocean, um, because you know after the Earth cooled down and formed a planet, there was no continents. It was all just basically basaltic oceanic crust, which is all very heavy, and the nascent earliest oceans would have covered almost all of that material. And so there's been research as to figuring out when continents actually started to form as large permanent land masses. And this new study suggests that uh, these first large cratons, uh, which is the basement rock that forms continents, emerged from the ocean between 3.3 and 3.2 billion years ago. Previous models usually estimated it about two and a half billion years ago. Uh, so that's a significant pushing back of that time period. And this has implications for understanding habitability of land surfaces around the world and a few other things. Uh, but these cratonic rocks in India have shown evidence of surface non-marine erosion. This is the kind of thing, uh, these particular kinds of sedimentary rocks, it's a sandstone. Uh, you see these structures here, these kind of concave swooping structures are called cross beds, uh, which are really only found reliably in surface uh, erosional water environments. There we go. So the continents had to exist above the surface of the sea for this kind of erosion and deposition to occur. And they found zircon crystals, which is a very hard, very persistent mineral located in these kinds of sandstones that were dated to 3.3 billion years ago. Uh, and they are they overlay uh, unconformably on the uh, Singboom Craton, which is one of the oldest uh, rock bodies in India. And so this rise of the continents is attributed to magmatic thickening at the base of the crust at the time, uh, which then sort of buoyed these masses of rock above the surface of the ocean. That's a very complicated but interesting uh, field of sort of geophysics that I'm not going to go into. Also related to sort of magmatism was this interesting survey of southwest volcanoes. 
Um, the researchers compiled all 2,200 quaternary volcanoes dotting the southern desert southwest of the U.S. Uh, those are all less than 2.6 million years old. These are all what are called a monogenetic volcano. That means they only have one eruption and then they stop forever. Uh, these eruptions can last either a few days or decades or you know, centuries, depending on the system. But you know, why are these important to study? 2.6 million years is a long time, but a lot of these are much younger than that. Some of these go back only a couple thousand years. Uh, but these represent an understudied and largely under, under understood, understudied volcanic hazard in the southern US. Uh, these are clustered in volcanic fields and eruptions from these can take out significant uh, transportation infrastructure and cause hazards from lava flows and ash clouds. Um, but these uh, volcanic fields where future eruptions will take place at some point, uh, there's probably about an 8% chance in the next century of one of these monogenetic volcanic eruptions cropping up somewhere in the southwest. Uh, and these could be quite substantially uh, impactful to the desert southwest. Sort of on a more macro scale here, some more cataclysm is a, uh, the end Ordovician mass extinction. A new study uh, sought to kind of figure out the causes of this earliest known mass extinction uh, at 445 million years ago at the end of the Ordovician period. And this saw the disappearance of 85% of all marine life. Uh, and now unlike other mass extinctions like the end Cretaceous dinosaur killing mass extinction, this one took course over the span of you know, maybe 500,000 to 200 million years, to 2 million years, not 200 million years. And they figured out a possible cause was a mass deoxygenation of deep ocean waters, which is really interesting. And to figure that out, they used iodine in some complicated tree of chemical reactions, tracks oxygen content in ocean waters and by extension sedimentary rocks that are exposed from this time period. And they figured out that deep ocean circulation of water could be affected by climate change, effectively shutting off that deep ocean water circulation conveyor belt system and cause a mass deoxygenation and die off of marine life at this period. So that's very interesting. And some researchers have suggested that uh, the sort of climatic event we're in right now could lead to a similar um, slowing down of that ocean circulation network, but to call it anything potentially like the end or division mass extinction is uh, effectively hyperbolic. And of special interest to me was the deepest earthquake ever recorded. So this earthquake was detected in the South Pacific, south of Japan at 751 kilometers deep. That's 467 miles. It was an aftershock of another deep earthquake, which was uh, located somewhere up here in the four or 500 kilometer depth range. Uh, but this is really weird because earthquakes generally occur sort of in the five to 100 kilometer depth range. Uh, but this one is seven times deeper than that. And the high temperatures and pressures that are present at this area in the lower mantle should really make earthquakes impossible because an earthquake has to have, uh, you know, a brittle sudden release of energy. But if the rocks are so hot that they're plastic, then, you know, we expect them to bend and deform rather than to break and cause an earthquake. So this is very strange. So the rocks are expected to bend rather than break, but the researchers suggested that the subducted Pacific slab, because the Pacific plate here is moving this way and diving underneath uh, the Philippine plate here, uh, this is a cross section of that subduction zone, that this subducted slab of oceanic crust could be curled up down here somewhere and still be cool and brittle enough to break in an earthquake that can be detected from the surface rather than simply deforming. And also something interesting that I didn't know about was that in this particular geologic environment, olivine, which makes up uh, a large percentage of oceanic plates, transmit transitions directly into ringwoodite at those temperature and pressure regimes. And when you have the shear like you have in a diving oceanic subducting plate, then that can create fractures which can then propagate under lab conditions at least, and maybe contribute to earthquake genesis at this time, at this temperature and depth. So this is enigmatic and very interesting and definitely something I'm gonna try and keep tabs on in the future. Staying sort of in the Eastern hemisphere, there's a new model of the Tibetan Plateau. Now the Tibetan Plateau is the largest and highest area of 
you know, alpine territory in the world. It was created largely, mostly by the collision of India and Asia, but why exactly it has persisted as long as it has, maybe as much as 65 million years, is unclear. It's an enigma. However, um, so there's really two models of the way uh, the crust behaves in this part of the world. There's the jelly sandwich model, which suggests a weak lower crust in this area, surrounded by a strong and brittle upper crust and a strong and brittle lower upper mantle right here. So that would suggest that this part is kind of gooey and uh, plasticky. But there's also the creme brulee model, which suggests a thin, strong upper crust and a weak, gooey lower crust and upper mantle. However, these researchers, uh, this guy, Rinberg, uh, compiled seismic data from a 2008 earthquake, which was located right about here in China and coupled with some GPS total station data, also from this part of China, uh, showed the way the crust on the surface at least deformed as a result of this earthquake. This earthquake was very interesting and there was uh, something called after slip after the earthquake happened. Uh, the fault continued to slowly creep on the surface. We see that sometimes here in the US, um, but the magnitude of the after slip that was seen on this uh, Longman Shan fault uh, was able to be coupled with the GPS data in such a way that showed that the lower crust was deforming much more than the upper crust or the upper mantle, which supports this jelly sandwich model of a gooey lower crust and a strong upper crust and upper mantle, at least under the Tibetan plateau. So lower crustal flow dynamics is something that is very complicated and also quite cool. And an upcoming piece of news is the second consecutive La Nina year in this uh, El Nino Southern Ocean Oscillation event cycle, where the trade winds have strengthened, which pools the warmer water in the Western Pacific and upwells cold water in the East Pacific. So this is normal conditions. Uh, this color scale is uh, average oceanic temperature. And this is what it looks like now. We have warm water, the trade winds are pushing the warm water formerly present across the equator into what's called a bulge, the oceanic surface bulge over here around Indonesia and the Philippines, and a little bit here in Australia. And that causes cold water to upwell from the depths uh, off of South America. And this influences our weather patterns in such a way that we get generally, this is an average of all uh, recorded La Nina years, that we get a wetter winter here in the Pacific Northwest, uh, but here, even further Pacific Northwest, we get a uh, drier climate here in British Columbia, Southern Alaska, and also much of the Southern United States. Uh, but the models are currently showing a high chance of at least a moderate strength La Nina winter, and there's about a 50% chance it will continue through the first half of next year. So hopefully we'll, we will definitely get a cooler, wetter winter to <laughs> Uh, sate our water deficit, our water thirsts, and hopefully that's good news. And that's all I've got for this month, and I will see you in December. Andrew, thank you again, as always, for a wonderful comprehensive uh, survey of everything that's happening in geology in the past month. Appreciate it. We have time for a few questions. Uh, Peregrine, I see you had your hand up there uh, for either Rachel or Andrew. Peregrine, we go. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. I'm wondering. Um, I have a question for Rachel. Uh, okay. What, I'm wondering about those hydrologic implications of your mapping. And, okay. Uh, if there was anything that really popped out there. Um, not in particular. I'll be honest. Hydrology is uh, very much not my specialty. My my elements tend to be fire and earth, uh, not water. Uh, so I have not done a huge amount of academic work into the area. Uh, however, uh, the locations of each of the units, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, they've got different porosity properties as well as the chemistry uh, entails different minerals being leached out uh, of these rocks and introduced to the water supply, depending on where the water's traveling to and from. And uh, rhyolite flows tend to be fairly complicated hydro uh, hydraulically. Um, yes, they tend to be vesicular and look like they should be porous. However, uh, most of the time, the, these uh, uh, bubbles that you see in, in the lavas, uh, they're, they're actually not connected. So they don't work very well as uh, reservoirs. However, the more intermediate flows, such as the andesites and the basalts, while the solid portions of the rock are 
very uh, fairly impermeable, uh, the vesicular or holy portions uh, of the rock that occur at the top of the flows, uh, those tend to work fantastically as aquifers. And actually they're utilized throughout much of the area where we've got Columbia River basalts. Um, so if, knowing where these flows are, the, where, where the margins of these flows occur, et cetera, uh, is kind of a big deal because it allows us the, it gives us a little bit of knowledge on what's going to preferentially soak up water, what's going to just transport the water, uh, what particular units can be utilized as potential aquifers, things like that. Um, and tufts uh, can, at least until they hit a certain point, can be utilized as aquifers. Um, I, one of the downsides is, is uh, the fact that these rhyolite eruptions and some of these tuff eruptions uh, form glass, and when glass erodes, it makes clay. And clay, as we know since the dawn of time, having been used in ceramics, uh, clay is pretty impermeable. So. Uh, knowing what's glass, what's uh, what's starting to erode, et cetera, uh, gives us a very a very good resolution image of where somebody with much greater hydrologic knowledge than myself can uh, turn around and apply. Okay, where's water actually going to flow through this kind of an area? Did you notice an area that it? you know, if you had a hydrologist asking you, like, where should I go look that you would point them to particularly that might have surprised you? Um, there was the backside of one of the mountains in Magpie Table that ended up having a spring with a little bit of uh, alteration, which means that the uh, water uh, uh, coming out of it uh, was heated at some point enough to start not just eroding the minerals around it, but to start actually changing the chemistry of the minerals around it. Um, and I found that interesting, but mostly because I uh, I, I, I like finding uh, precious gems and minerals and metals and stuff when I'm when I'm out in the woods, and I'm pretty good at it. Um, unfortunately, this area, um, because it's lava flows rather than lava intrusions, there's not a whole lot of that that was in the area. I mean, there's lots of examples of lovely obsidian, and near the mapping area, there's lovely examples of serpentine as well. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, as far as hydrology goes, I, I, not particularly. I, a lot of the stuff was concentrated near fault lines, which is kind of to be expected because while some of those areas, some of those lava flows are definitely good at storing water, um, faults are definitely easier transporting it and letting it out. I mean, it's basically cracks and things leak out of cracks. That's the nature of cracks. Thanks. Right. No well, uh, we have a couple of other questions, but we are right at the top of the hour. I want to respect everyone's time. If you came for an hour, you can leave at the end of this hour. Um, thanks. You, you don't have to go home, but uh, you can you, you don't have to stay on the Zoom after uh, after the hour. But for those who want to ask questions or stick around a little longer, also, uh, I could use your help. Uh, for those of you who were here when we had our interruption, I could use some ideas about how to tighten our security and maybe uh, plan a little bit better for those sorts of interruptions. So um, I'm going to turn off the recording and then we'll continue with questions. But uh, your, the, your hour is over, your, your duty to the club uh, and to the social group, the order is, is complete. Uh, thank you and come back next month or uh, come back at third, the third week of uh, the month for the in-person meetup if you happen to be in Portland.